it's not just the case that you're always driven by the ideas that you conceive of inside yourself. Sometimes what it sounds like feeds you in a certain way and you start making sounds in that way. I had such a great time chatting with today's guest in person in Australia. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And today we are chatting with Ben Robertson. What an awesome person. What a great musician. One of Australia's best known jazz bassists. And this is the first of what will be many conversations from my trip to Australia here on the podcast. We'll let Ben set the scene for where we're chatting. But oh my goodness, what a trip. I had such a great time. And it was so cool to sit down and chat with Ben. I had just heard him perform that day when we sat down to chat, and we talk about that, we talk about his career, we talk about improvisation, so many great topics. I know you're going to love hearing from Ben, and I just can't wait to spend more time with him in the future. Quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Modacity, Colstein Music, A440 Violin Shop, and Encoda. More on them later, but let's dig into today's chat with Ben Robertson. Ben, it's great to meet you in person. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jason. My first bassist chatted with in Australia, so we're here. I just saw you play first. Yeah. Oh, what an honor. Yeah. Um, Live, anyway. Uh, And and just saw you play a show. Yeah. uh, And just got done like 30 minutes ago. That's right. I thought, you know, it's not something I do all the time, what you saw, but it was good to, to, I guess... Um, see me doing something that's you know like a bit out of my ordinary thing, doing a show on stage with a music theatre singer, being versatile, you know. And we're here at is Hamer Hamer Hall. Hamer Hall. Hamer is Hall. Not named after a Victorian premier, Richard Hamer. Yeah. Yeah, and we're, so we're in. It's uh, uh, Ben was just giving you a, a quick tour of this whole area with the the is it the Crown? The, yeah, the Botanic Gardens the here. Botanic Gardens is where we are. Yeah, and, and the government house is further yeah. up, and it's the it's the the gardens precinct of this is the we're in the arts precinct of Melbourne where the concert hall is and it's a be- really beautiful area. Did you grow up? Where did you grow up? I grew out in an eastern suburb out of Melbourne, okay, called Eltham. Grew up uh, and sort of a bit of a bush. I, I I think it was pretty bushy. Like when I was a kid, you went off on for the day on your bike and just went riding in your gum boots and mum would blow the whistle for you at about six o'clock at night and throw you in the bath and that was a whole day of and there was you didn't see many houses so I grew up out in the bush a bit you know with wow. a real kind of free kind of experience of the environment which was good for me did you come from a musical family I You're, did yeah okay. I everyone sort of played and I pretty much just followed I had an I have an older brother and sister who are twins they're both really great musicians one of them is a professional player and I kind of followed when you've got older brothers and sisters who are six years older, you learn a lot of stuff from them, like, you know, how do the chords go to the girl from Impanema, <laughs> right. which actually we never quite worked out, but okay. but you can learn a lot of stuff. Like, we listened to the Beatles a lot as kids, and we, we just played along with things all the time. Mm. And so I was very lucky in that respect. And my dad is a great, was a great uh, violinist and pianist, and so I was very lucky to get played a lot of great records as a kid. Yeah, I listened a lot to the Oscar Peterson trio, and Dad played me that Heifetz playing the Corn Gold Violin Concerto. Oh, there we go. Yeah, he just, you know, he was mad on Fritz Cross. I listened to a lot of violinists, and uh, because that was Dad's thing, and so I think I was pretty lucky. You know, I think I might have been lucky enough to grow up in that era when there was a lot of music played, say after tea, yeah, rather than watching telly. We didn't have a telly, so I feel really lucky to have had such a musical family and environment. Well, you know, I was just mentioning Heifetz. I got, I got to throw this in because just like a week and a half ago, I was playing San Francisco Symphony, the uh, violin soloist, uh, plays on that Heifetz violin. Oh, and no. there is a there is a blemish in the varnish because Heifetz did this thing. He would flick the violin up and kind of like sweep his thumb out. And that violin has this like permanent <laughs> Heifetz <laughs> stain that no one no one will. will but it was so and, and talk about an influence for me, too. My youth orchestra director growing up would invite some of us over and just play all these Heifetz videos and I remember you know well he's uh, he's I mean he he's such a he's almost too good a player yeah to like you just feel like 
you know, sometimes I look at the bass and look at the violin and listen to someone incredible like Haifutu or a young recording of Jacqueline Dupre mm-hmm. playing and think, wow, there's a challenge in the bass there. But I, but I, I like, I also like what the bass can do that's different to what the, all those other instruments can yeah. do as well. But yeah, I, I, I feel... Yeah, my, my, I didn't really become a bassist until uh, properly until I really was at university studying for an arts degree. Really? No, I, I sort of um, just played a lot of music, played a lot of other instruments, piano and guitar, and also I learned a bit of trombone at high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I was always kind of an ear player, and so the bass was the first instrument where I had proper lessons with a classical teacher, and uh, you know you know practiced regularly and and I, it became my professional instrument but it, it, and so I, I guess I came to the bass with a whole lot of musical ideas formed mm-hmm. rather than I didn't learn music on the bass if you know what I mean yeah yeah which I, I I've sort of thought was strange but then I realized that lots of bassists come to the bass in that way yeah and I think it's interesting because if you talk to a violinist like I can't think of any working violinist that started in university maybe there is somebody but i mean i it's something that it seems like everybody i know they picked up when they were five years old or eight years old at the oldest but yeah they're, they're it's it's unbelievable how many ba- professional bassists come to and i think maybe there maybe that can happen with wind instruments too like trombone or tuba or Especially something like the that big ones yeah that maybe it's something with the bigger the, instruments you know the, 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 well i would have thought the bass the demands of the bass probably only equaled by maybe the tuba in yeah. terms of the physical mm-hmm. side of things you know getting the notes moving it's a it's a big sound but um yeah i i, I think it's it's really common and i think that's why the bass has got a unique there's a unique thing about the bass is that you get lots of but also it might explain why someone like me who i'm older now i'm still practicing like mad because mm-hmm. I didn't start when I was six on the bass, so I still feel like it's a real journey of discovery and development, and I really, um, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to feel sort of all like, oh, no, that I've, I've done the bass. It's like, I don't feel like that at all. I feel like, oh, crikey, you know, there's something new and wonderful, and how can I do that? Yeah. Um, leaving Heifetz aside. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a physicality to the instrument that I think is really interesting. And people that come to the bass, I've had folks who pick up the bass later in life say they're, one, and I've asked what's one of the biggest surprises, and they say just how much physical exertion there is playing it's, this It's thing. very athletic, isn't yeah. it? And yeah. I, um, it, I think it's interesting to think about your own playing over your lifetime and how, like my playing's changed a lot. And... Often you look back on different stages of your playing in your life, and I'm, I've been a freelancer all my life, and so the things you end up playing influence your playing in certain ways, like you're playing a lot with a certain style of ensemble or a certain approach to... And my real thing is improvising. That's what I love doing the most, and that's what I, where I really feel sort of free and at home. But, of course, you know... To be really musical, you need to be influenced by who you're playing with. You need their playing to sort of infuse your playing with qualities and characteristics. And so you often look back and and you can see a real trajectory and change in your playing, which you're not aware of at the time. And I was thinking about how that, you know, I, I would often... I would think one really great thing is to just remind yourself that it's so each stage you're in, you probably don't know what it is at the time, but it's recognizable later. But that's a luxury you don't have as a musician sometimes is to realize, to see yourself from the outside, because you're often right inside the process of playing, especially because of improvising is this process where you're, you're thrown into the moment and you, you're, you're sort of left with this question of, well, well what have I got? as a player right now. It's not about what I've prepared always, it's about, okay, someone's calling a tune in, in a key I haven't played it in before. And so you, you're sort of left with that question of what can I come with, up with right now that contributes to that musical moment? And that's why I feel like practicing and developing yourself as a player for, for an improvising bass player is really important because um, you need those resources in the moment when you play rather than, and it's, it's really different to how one would go about preparing for uh, a repertoire recital which I've also done it's such a different mindset it's really almost sometimes 
it's even hard to explain how different that is, that mindset of strict repertoire, there's a clear right and wrong, and whereas it's like, what if someone says, we don't know what you're going to play? Well, that's a pretty, for some people, that's a very strange premise to start playing, but it's also supremely exciting. It's, yeah, it's, it's so different. You just hit on like 20 of my favorite topics, right? Good. There. So that's that, a good what, start. What, one of them is, is just like how much neater things look in the rearview mirror. And I mean, whether you're talking about anything in your career, but and I'm sure even more so for an improvising musician, because I can just think like, oh, you aren't probably thinking, oh, I'm in my chromatic phase right now or something like that. Or, oh, I'm in my... Actually, that's the one I'm in right now. Are you really? <laughs> I'm in a chromatic phase <laughs> because I've been transcribing things that have a lot of chromaticism. Yeah, I do agree. And you, but you don't have, in fact, it's also a really interesting comparison between composing and improvising, which is a really interesting topic because I sort of dabble in all those fields as a player. But when you, when you improv, like, it's a very uh, fruitful discussion to have with other musicians about what's the difference. And some people think improvising is, is live um, composition, and some people think it's not at all. And uh, I think it's a great discussion because it, I don't think there's one answer to that question actually because there's so many ways to improvise and it's funny to talk about improvising. We could be talking about um, all the way from really free sonic playing where you're just playing with sound and sonority and you know found sound and banging things and it's fantastic kaleidoscope of sounds right through to um, say improvising on tunes like standards with changes on harmonies and all that stuff which I love doing. And I'm not saying I do all this, but I'm just thinking of the spectrum of improvising right through to almost precise recitation of material. Mm -hmm. And so within all that, there are so many ways to improvise that it's almost like a person could be thinking about improvising as that really far extreme of improvising where you just everything is improvised every sound like we're not even thinking of a tonality or a rhythm we're just dealing with sound but i mean the majority of what i've done as a player is playing on tunes you know like a, as a jazz player mm -hmm. and um and so but i love i still i still think within that there is that potential for anything to happen but um the big difference, getting back to the original thing we started, to, you, you brought up, was the hindsight thing, mm -hmm. is that I think the greatest difference is a composer can really rework material, but when you're improvising, you just kind of got to go with what happens. So if there's some, there's some sort of something that's a bit funky that happens while you're playing, that's in, if it's a performance, that's kind of what you, what you're stuck with, rather than. Perhaps if you're composing, you think, oh, I'm, I might not have that bit. I might edit that or I might change that. And that's where I see the, the big influence of the studio coming into, into affecting how we now hear improvising because you've got that potential to use the studio as an, as an instrument as well and you can perfect and change things. Yeah, it's 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 I, a lot of composers I know are improvisers too, but I but I can see how different a modality that is. And and somebody we were talking about on the way over here, Andres Martin, who improvises but also composes. I've talked with him a lot about how and I think it's super interesting how people how people compose and and the structure or if they do it regularly or if they do it on their instrument or the, the piano or they're singing things into a recorder and then practicing. Practicing improv, I think, is super fascinating. So it's yeah. something that I've spent very little, some time doing, but very little. Yeah. Um, how do you? Maybe we could start with composing. Like, like, what do you? How have you? Uh, well, I've probably composed a little bit like what you describe. I think the most successful things I've written have elements of my improvisational qualities to them. So there's sometimes a little bit. Is it called reverse engineering when you sort of record something and then write it? Something like mm -hmm, that, you mm -hmm. know, where you're sort of like, you know, it, it would be a common thing to say, oh, here's a bunch of really nice changes. What, and then just sort of blow over them, improvise over them and think, gee, that, that's starting to sound like something that could be, that it sounds like maybe like me or something I would play. And that, that develops the character that sounds like something you'd compose. Um, I think I might have been spurred a little bit in that and lis listening to uh, somewhere I heard, I may not be 
completely accurate with this, but I do remember reading that Joe Zawinul on that Heavy Weather, the, the album Heavy Weather, a lot of that was recordings of jams and improvs in that band with with that, that, those fantastic musicians and then sort of turning them into pieces that they then improvised. And I always kind of was captivated by that idea. And yeah. so that kind of might have driven me to think a bit like that. So, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm always... The main thing I've done when I've... So I'm a real collaborator as well as... Like my... Often I've worked in collaboration with people in composing things. So, you know, for a jazz player, that might mean working up arrangements of tunes or stuff for an album and that sort of thing. Especially with my wife, who's a fantastic uh, singer and musician. So we've written things together. But we... So one of the things that always concerns me is what sort of a structure or how it's going to work out for improvisers. So I would be thinking from the outset if I was writing something, what's this going to be like to, to blow on, you know, for an improviser? Like, you know, rather than write a really complicated set of changes that sounds great of a reharmonization of a simple melody, it's like, well, what are you going to be beholden to when you start improvising? Yeah. Are you going to just adhere to the melody or, or are these changes going to start dictating how you play? Because I, f I feel like a lot of the sort of pedagogy around improvising is based on this sort of verticalization of harmony which is oh, it's you know it's invaluable like i could not i would not be the player i was without that sort of thinking but there's also a whole way to think about improvising like varying theme and variation just based on melody and that often gets underdone especially in 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 jazz playing because there's so much information in the changes and so, you know, you're just getting locked into arpeggiation and that sort of thing. But I've also always been fascinated by players who seem to be able to sort of sidestep that just chord scale thing and th and come up with amazing melody ideas, which sometimes don't have so much to do with the harmony. And they sound, but they sound sort of incredible. There is that, there is, I've... I've been to many string conferences in the States uh, where there's a session like how to teach a violist how to improvise and that sort Ooh. of thing, right? And, and, and I, I'm always fascinated because I've, you know, I have a, a, a very, a bit of jazz background, but, you know, maybe a little more than your average violist, but not, you know, I'm certainly an amateur jazz player, but it's, it's really interesting to see because as soon as you start to really get into pretty serious jazz harmony and the verticality of jazz it's yeah, i can see the fear you know setting into the eyes of those who don't speak that language so much and and i've, I've seen this people uh attempt to explain building things more melodically thinking a little more a little more horizontally and and just try, try so that's something that 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 i always every every time i uh start to work uh, with a student in jazz, I break out my patterns in jazz books or that sort of thing, and yeah. start to go through the changes. Well, uh, yeah, because a lot of a lot of the the sort of underpinnings of jazz bass playing is based on the formulas of, you know, voice leading and mm -hmm. good good bass lines. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of learning you can do in that. But uh, I think it can be tricky when it comes to being developing themes and stuff. Everyone, you, you get so locked into the bottom end of everything which is beautiful and it and it, it helps everybody so much if you do that but then when you, your chance to contribute say in other ways like say you're playing in a smaller combo like a trio or a duo um, and you can be more expansive in the harmony but you're kind of locked into these these you sort of held to these patterns that you're so good at that, that it's a pretty common thing to, to talk to say especially bass players and they they don't feel like they can escape from the the grid of the chords it's like ah i'm stuck <laughs> on the g7 pattern how do i get out of it um and for me the thing that really is terribly helpful is just thinking what's the tune you know do you know the tune to this set of changes and it's a pretty common ba bass player thing to not to sort of know the tune but not know how it fits into what they're playing so one thing i've done a lot of is just ask a student to okay play the bass line and sing me the tune you know, and it's it's great because it can be rough, rough as. I mean, I, I'm no professional singer, neither are they, and I don't have no expectation of them to sound like um, perfect as a singer. But I, it, it's incredibly good for your ears as a musician to to think of what that melody is, and is that the because in a lot of those standards, a lot of that melody describes the harmony as well. The melody gives you all the underpinnings of the harmony, and after a while. You can actually memorize tunes more simply just as 
as as melodies and you can forget the changes Mm -hmm. because the melody starts to suggest to you what the harmony is rather than it's a whole different experience once you start thinking melodically you stop thinking oh all the things you are goes f minor to b flat minor you don't think of that you think it goes da di da 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 da, and you're thinking of it as for what the tune implies and and you're hearing the harmony come down from the top of the melody Upton Bass is at a fascinating transition from selling accessories online, kind of in the early days, to selling other people's basses, to starting to make their own basses, which they now do and make over 120 a year. Here are Eric and Gary of Upton Bass on that transition. So then we stopped getting containers of instruments. Right, yeah. Which was... A lot of dough all at once. So it was, it was taxing and the quality was going down, down, down with every shipment, you know. And at that point, we were doing so much ourselves anyways. Final assembly, varnish, setup. It was kind of a no-brainer to start making them in-house. Whatever your playing needs are, Upton Bass will find you an instrument that works with your budget and that you will love for the long term. They have an amazing, loyal fan base that has bought, several people have bought two, three, even four Upton Basses over the years. They stand behind their products. They're beautiful instruments made in the Northeast in the United States. UptonBass.com and thanks so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass, and I've always been impressed by how Steve manages to get basses sounding so vibrant, whether it's a student-level bass or a top-of-the-line professional bass. Here's Steve on some of what he has learned in terms of setup. When steel strings came into general use around 1959, the German bass makers flipped out, and they really got scared that they're going to get big shiploads of basses back that got wrecked by these high-tension steel strings. And so they did three things that really changed the function of the instrument. They shortened the string length, and they lowered the neck angle so the bridges weren't that tall anymore. And then they made the tops a lot thicker. They really wanted to ensure that these basses were not going to come back across the ocean uh, for work anymore. And so the basses tend to sound kind of nasal, and they didn't have any depth. They didn't have a chest voice at all. You know, and so what we do with increasing the neck angle, and we can also increase the overstands for modern playing, can get up in a thumb position a lot easier. So a neck reset can accomplish that. Sometimes we'll transplant a neck or make a new neck for these basses that might have a string length that are not friendly to modern playing. Learn more about what Steve can do to get your bass playing better and check out his great selection of basses at steveswanstringbass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. This episode is brought to you by Encoda. By the way, that's spelled N-K-O-D-A. This app is like Netflix or Spotify for sheet music, and they are working with over a hundred of the major publishers like Boozy and Hawks, Baron Writer, and more to provide sheet music on your device. I have an iPad Pro, but this also works on Android, and I have so many pieces from Encoda loaded up on it. I have all the Beethoven symphonies and their scores. I'm circling things. I'm flipping between the score and the part to show students. I totally love this app, and people like Sir Simon Rattle are singing its praises. It really is the next thing for musicians. It's a subscription service, and you can download Encoda from your app store today for a free trial. That's N-K-O-D-A. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. My daily companion for practicing is the app Modacity. I love it so much, and the interface is so simple. You open it up, and you see a microphone and a timer. And here is Modacity founder Mark Gelfel on why you see that in the interface. It comes down to practice efficiency. And practice efficiency, the way that I think about it, is equipment with three different variables. One of them is learning milestones, one of them is retention, and the other is time. I define practice efficiency as learning milestones times retention divided by time spent. Modacity has helped my practicing so much and so many other people I know. You can learn more at modacity.co and visit our site for a special offer on lifetime access to this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. But that's that's one of those things that uh, I think as bass players, I mean, there are some great things about thinking about the root structure and the core. I think that's why so many bass players end up being uh, going into composing or doing things like that. But yeah, it's like the joke, like, oh, you, that's the tune that goes bump, 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 right? <laughs> you know, I like or, 
that or, joke or I remember, you know, it's like a diss that, that I would hear is like, hey, nice bass solo. It basically just sounded like your sped up bass line. But, you know, <laughs> I think it's something that we fall into and just not thinking about the melody. Yeah, it's, it's a great starting point. I mean, it's, a, it's a, such a good starting point. And you need to function as a bass player. Like the other, you know, like it's important, you know, if you're a young player or if, or if you're, you're anyone as a player you need to be supportive in an ensemble because that's the general context of bass playing I mean leaving aside being a soloist which is also can sound incredible and is an amazing thing or, or even say playing in different uh, situations where it's not but in a, in a functional jazz improvising context it's terrific to be able to sort of make everyone else feel good, support them in a great way while they play and I don't think you it's necessary to think about improvising as just taking a solo like everything can be improvised from the first moment you play together from from who's going to play first from what even keys the tune in or um, how fast is it going to go what's the feel going to be like um, it's it's great to see to be part of musicians who are listening for what changes you're playing in that turnaround into the bridge you know when there's a couple of options who are like you know cocking their ear or looking across at you it doesn't all, you know, those things are re- really great part of the conversation that I've always been a part of as a rhythm section player. Um, what, What is the harmony there? And maybe sometimes those are verbal discussions. Hey, what are you doing, you know, going into the bridge of that? Oh, I'm, I'm playing a, 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 you know, half-step turnaround there going up a semi. Oh, that sounds great, yeah. Well, these are the Cedar Walton changes to to uh, body and soul there's a little extra giant steps turn around <laughs> those things are great things because they they really broaden your vocabulary they broaden your ears and the thing that you don't understand harmonically as a player you can go and and study it mm-hmm. and you can go oh I, I just don't get what that is what is that you know you might sit at the piano and play some harmony and and realize that you didn't you didn't understand it and and it's it's a great way to learn so i've always used my ears to trigger what I will learn next. So basically I would, you know, very commonly, anything I can't hear when I'm in terms of, even with, with repertoire playing, with classical playing, like interval leaps or shifts or anything, I often go back to, to well, can I sing it? Mm, yeah. If I can sing it, I usually can, well, first I can correct it because I can hear it, but um, it means I'm conceiving of it before I've played it and that's super helpful especially with improvising because it's it's not exactly the same because it's it's so fast when you when you're improvising that there's stuff you know you can't do all of that in you can't you know s- play everything that you've heard but there's an element of that there where you're actually um in I feel like when when improvising is really happening you're actually playing as if you're singing mm. if that yeah. makes sense yeah for sure for sure. You know, I did a, I did an exercise a few years ago about looking back at everything I took at university and everything I've done since university and what I what I y- didn't use, what I used a lot and what I didn't do that I wish I'd gotten. And I was thinking, things I do all the time that I didn't get really any training or I didn't take the initiative to get training on, singing, playing piano. I have such there was this great course taught by a jazz piano professor in Chicago. Um, jazz piano for the non-pianist or something to that effect um, and it's it's just amazing to me how much piano seems to open up doors I, for folks oh, I so agree I, I, I would be sunk without the piano mm-hmm. like I really I, I, I noticed that as a default for a lot of great great musicians that piano default you know like that ability to to they mightn't be flashy players but mm-hmm. they're able to sit down play the harmony through to something maybe know some nice voicings, know some extended two-hand voicings. And it's it's a pretty common thing, you know, and, and I think it's it's invaluable because it just gives you that... It's almost like you, you, you sort of can draw away from... Well, you're playing an instrument that's a mechanical instrument, so it's mm-hmm. so wonderful not to stress about intonation, yeah. for starters. It's wonderful just to go, oh, great, you just press a D-flat, or, well, you know, the A-flats aren't woofy, or, you right. know, all that beautiful stuff. On I love that about the piano, and you're just dealing... It's sort of the first um, technology in music, isn't mm-hmm. it, really, the piano? It's, it's such a, you know, the invention of temperament. I love that about the piano, and so, yeah... But there's things the piano can't do as well. You know, it can't play that beautiful legato. It can't do a beautiful portamento between things. You can't do vibrato on it. Um, 
it just doesn't sound rich and nutty like a bass does. But I, I feel that the piano is one of the big things that's influenced my bass playing. It's, it's, it's how, it's that sort of the plainness of the notes. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. You know, that sort of beautiful, clean plainness. I love that. And the other thing is like, you know, super influenced by drummers because um, I've pretty much, unlike say a bass section player, I've, I've played most of my life with, with my closest musical compatriot is the drummer because you know I'm I'm syncing my sound to them we're but we're blending our sound so I'm really aware of those drummers that can really look after the way I sound by the way they play the drums so I've always really wanted to develop musical rapport with drummers in the same way as say with pianists of the with the harmony of the piano or, or of the guitarist the same sort of thing and all of those instruments I've I've played a little bit of as well, and I've become incredibly um, like I was discussing with a musician just before the gig today about the concept of feathering on the kick drum, and how that's something that that is a tradition in drumming where they just feather very lightly off, and when you're playing say crotchets in a swing feel, and it's excruciatingly difficult to do because I've <laughs> actually asked someone it's like one of those. It's like the subtleties of bow technique, really, yeah. and it's extremely difficult. And so, but it it can make you sound beautiful when someone feathers very lightly on the kick drum, and you're playing crotchets. Suddenly, your sound gets big, and it's it's like, oh, I sound like twice the bass player I was. And that's that's of course a, a wonderful drummer helping you out. Um, yeah, that's something I've become more and more aware of as the importance of. So. It's the importance of, as a bass player, facing outwards into everyone in the group. So making your instrument something that goes with everything else. thats It's a really beautiful part for me of playing ensemble music and improvising is that thing of... Like, I think I from conversations I have with section players, it's like what, what they say about section playing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that idea of you're part of the whole, that beautiful big sound when you all land a pits together and it goes dunk and sounds yeah. sounds just beautiful. It's like that same feeling and it's it's something you can't, you can't sort of necessarily always discuss but it just comes from a sort of intuitive kind of relationship. And there's something similar going on with drummers like watching, being beside a drummer, watching them move, how they signal things when things are building up, um, how they're going to support you. Because a a drummer can really kind of also obliterate you very easy. It's a very loud instrument. It's extremely hard to play, make it feel good and not be too loud. And so I do adore that about all the great drummers I play with is that that stuff can happen. And I'm I'm in their hands, you know. I remember, I remember back at university, uh, we had this jazz combo that should have been amazing. And we just hated the group. We just couldn't stand playing with each other. And then we switched drummers. And then we loved each other. And it was like, what are those things? What's wrong? And the, the, it, was a, it, it was a good player, but it just, the, 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 with the sensitivity and all that, all of a sudden it, it came in. Yeah, and I, it's, it's very much, it, to me, it's about the, the tone color of the, and what part of the kit they play a lot. I mean, generally, it's great in the jazz context if the drummer is a bit lighter on the bottom of the kit and a bit bit more up the top of the kit, the cymbals and the higher sounds. That seems to work great. They're sympathetic to you. And that, I guess that's why electric basses are so fantastic in sort of rock and those sort of instruments. And that's, I guess that's also why you can see the, the development of a more electrified double bass sound coming through in those jazz rock eras in, in the, you know, the 80s and that sort of thing where... Um, some you know some beautiful players developing a more amplified sound in order to deal with that sort of the scenarios of rock rock influence in jazz because it's pretty tough going on acoustic instrument you know oh for sure and it's so it's so fascinating to me how that sound you know and then and then the traditional sound that especially in the 80s came back in now you hear all you know people across the spectrum it's interesting i was just talking to somebody uh recently don messina is his name is out on the east coast and and he was he was he plays completely unamplified gut strings and he says 
that restricts his gig selection because he will only play if it's if it's that setup. Versus, I just uh, we did an event in San Francisco with Brian Bromberg, who you want to talk about that electric sound. I mean, and he can play. I mean, your your jaw drops at what he plays, and and yeah. you pick up his bass. And not that it's all the bass, obviously it's Brian, but the I mean, you've never played on a lower action in your life, and it you well, know. Well, that's right. It, um, I was I had some great great teachers, but one of the great things. I remember a teacher saying once, you know, there's certain things you can and can't do with all sorts of setups on the bass. And I record myself a lot when I play just to check things out and listen to how things... And sometimes, the, I, you know, to my in my understanding, in my own development, and my own ability to what I can play, that there's a payoff between projection and sound mm -hmm. and just what you can play. And, you know... Um, it's 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 a really interesting, and it's also to do with sort of uh, it's it's quite subtle because when you start going up, I've I've and having tried lots of different things and developed different things due to what I was playing at times, it starts affecting what you want to play because you've got a certain setup. So this is I find this interesting, and this is something I'm doing a little bit of research about. But you, it's not just the case that you're always driven by the ideas that you conceive of inside yourself. Sometimes what it sounds like feeds you in a certain way and you start making sounds in that way. So you gave me that great example of that um, obviously beautiful sounding gut player with a, yeah. with, with, with a big projecting sound. I mean, it's such a beautiful sound and it's, it's completely seductive, but it also generates a certain way of playing. Right. And it, which is, you know, which I love. Um, and then if you listen to someone, you gave an example of Brian Bromberg playing and doing all that tapping and that, that highly developed personalised language. And that's a whole different vocabulary that just seems, it's, it's kind of like what works. But I don't think you could say, well, I, I'd love to argue, we could argue the point, I'm sure, but I don't think you could say that that came just from the conception of the person. It comes from them, but also comes from what the instrument brings forth in them, you know, what they... Wow, because the, all this sustain, I can, I can play a legato phrase here, and and I've experimented. I've had different stages of playing with different string heights and different instruments, and in some instruments it didn't make much difference what sort of string height I had. They just sounded a certain way, and I, it it was probably better not to make life hard for myself. But then, on like on my current instrument, it makes a massive difference when when you have a little more, a little more. Um, bit of a higher setup you just get all this punch mm -hmm. and it's really satisfying mm -hmm. and so the, the, I haven't really arrived at a hard and fast rule with that but I do know that there's just certain things that I just can't achieve with a huge setup uh, especially in the upper register like string you know getting across two strings playing thirds up high with it you're just disrupting the string so much especially with the bow when you're pressing down from a high height you're just you're disturbing the string, you're disturbing the bow that's near the fingers that are pressing those higher notes down. And so that, to me, seems to me, you know, that, that, that becomes a bit counterproductive, you know. If you, if you, it, it's probably not going to matter to the non-bass player whether you project your sound another five feet or not, you know. <laughs> In the end, it's like, did it sound... And so I don't ever want to sound out of control. And, and sometimes, I suppose, as a player, I have conceptions of ideas that are complicated. And so I won't, I don't necessarily want to attempt something like there's no way I can make. And that, that's, I guess that's the, that's where improvisers and people who are making up stuff in the moment, they're dealing with that sort of playoff as well. Because, because I suppose when you're preparing, I mean, I might be wrong, but um, you can work your way around some phrases or find a more satisfying fingering or say pl as the as the height gets higher maybe you play it up and down the one string a bit more i don't know I, I, there's there's no it's it's interesting you know wouldn't it be cool to play to play a gig one set gut strings no amp you know action up next one Brian Bromberg ask you got that pickup up and just to, just to like even like exact same rep uh, maybe it would be weird to have the exact same but but like what your idea is you're the same person but just the the nature of that setup like you're talking about how you would gravitate to, to different ideas you know I, I, I think so I think I think I think if you're I think if you're musical you will naturally do that because it'll just sound like 
you'll feel like suddenly on the gut, I feel like I'm Israel Crosby all of a sudden. And, <laughs> and, and I can just hear, my, hear myself sounding and making yeah. a big, warm sound. And it's, it's so satisfying. Once that big projected sound comes forth, one note counts for, for a lot of notes. If it goes thunk and it sounds just beautiful, it has this percussive impact in the music and suddenly you're affecting the music in that way. And I, then I guess the more legato sound starts affecting say things melodically or maybe you're yeah. getting in amongst the harmony harmonically and and i think it's yeah i, I would personally find that extremely difficult <laughs> because i know that when i've hopped on bases with other setups like say they're a bit lower than me i can't actually get my finger i can't hook the string to pits it and yeah. so that's a kind of a big deal for me because i i can't sort of get my time going and so, you know that feeling of kind of hooking into the string and, it, and it, it bouncing out of your fingers is a really big part of playing, say, crotchet, you know, crotchet, yeah. or just punchy rhythm time. And I think, I, I know I've had the same experience with the bow too, is where you, you're so used to getting some downforce into the string and suddenly the string's hitting the fingerboard. It's really quite off-putting. But um, I, I do notice that classical players' um, setups aren't, there's a sl- different set of priorities in, say, the curvature is quite important. And even if they're a bit low on, say, the E and the G, they'll still prefer that if they've got great bow clearance. Yeah, it's. I've, I've always been fascinated. I've talked to luthiers, too. You know, like, is there a classical or jazz setup? And and the answer I always get is, well, it depends. Not, but the, but one, but some of the things, th- like, I know as someone who predominantly plays with the bow and the classical, I want to be able to play a fortissimo C on the A string, you know, and not have to think about it rattling or that kind of thing. And and, and so, and and then, yeah, I don't want my, I, I don't want there to be, too little curvature on the bridge or I'm constantly focusing on not hitting two strings. Or, yeah, that, that's a tough yeah. one. And and also, of course, modern strings have changed. There's a lot of strings now that that don't that sound quite high when they're low. If you mm-hmm. know, if you compare to the old the older sort of say the metallic beautiful tomastic reds and stuff mm-hmm. which tended to sound you could really notice their string height. Yeah. But a lot of um, really good, like, hybrid-type strings, they, they sound pretty dunky, if, if you will use, could use that term for the sound, even when they're not unreasonably high. Yeah. Because, yeah, the gut, the gut tradition, such as we, you mentioned before, is very much... A lot of setup on bass from gut strings is very much about how wide the string vibrates. And so you have to have a lot of... Uh, fingerboard dressing to, to allow the string to not rattle mm-hmm. and um and cause they're quite they're quite um the tension isn't as high so even though they're physically high off the board when you actually go to press them down they're not resistant um and so that's why i think a lot of this the setup of basses is, has developed enormously quickly based around the technologies like if you think there's the advent of steel strings that changed everything there's the advent of going to f- fourths, mm. and then there's the the whole thing about um, yeah, and then there's you know pickups had yeah. such a big effect on, and r- microphones themselves, you know how you could record the bass, that whole advent of pickups allowed bass players to to it sort of started freeing up drummers a little more, um, and for a while there you know, I guess bass players were chasing, the really big rock kits and you know. All the kits that were built in the jazz era were, were thin-shelled and you could play them loud and they'd sound great and wouldn't drown you out. And then, of course, it, once rock kits started being used on jazz kits, they were really loud. Yeah. So bell bass players had trouble being heard. And and so I, I, I'm, I find it interesting how players who, say, played in... I remember reading somewhere that a player like Niels Henning Oster Peterson played with Tanya Maria and that was like a loud Latin band. So that's how he's kind of... Um, more amplified sort of style of playing came around. But I don't have any real fixed opinion about my own playing. I just sort of follow what feels good to me and I've probably become a more acoustic sounding player as I've got older. And um, I I was lucky enough to come up as a gigging player in the 80s. So I was sort of right in that era when I I, I think I, I remember feeling a bit like we were competing with 
uh, electric bass players who were influenced by people like beautiful players like Jaco Pistorius. And I remember having an argument with an engineer about even using a microphone on my bass in the recording studio. He he only wanted to just record it with a with a pickup, and I was saying. Yeah, but it, it's I want I want to hear the acoustic sound. He was saying, "Oh, we don't need that. We just need because I can control your pickups and there's no bleed." And that, it that was my first recording, and it was like I was oh, I had to sort of. I think I talked him into it in the end, but things have sure changed since that time. Well, and we were talking. It's another another topic I love uh, as we were walking over here. Uh, the differences between recording in the studio and then what you would do on a live performance. I know you've recorded a lot, and and like you just said, things have changed. You know, from the '80s till now, but still, like the talk, maybe talk through what do you, what do you do or what have you done in the studio in terms of amplification or just thinking of your playing in general versus what you what I saw you do today or any live situation. Yeah, well, I really like. Of course, I love to to someone who's sensitive to the music and to the sort of microphones that sound good on the bass and but it, the way the way monitoring works is really is important like a, a really separated recording session where everyone's on cans is can be quite difficult in terms of you're very reliant on the mix and it just never seems to feel quite the same i've always found intonation more difficult in recordings because you, do you have one ear off to hear yourself yeah. and then you're trying to tune to something that's coming through a speaker that can be tricky so but i've always favored you know a microphone sound with some of the pickup mixed in but not too much of it um but i i did i do think if you're going to use headphones and monitoring the type of headphones for, especially for double bass players is quite important some headphones like the really sound excluding ones are very hard to play with the, the, the ones drummers would use that really reject everything uh, they're almost impossible some headphones are incredibly trebly and they're just so terrifying to play the double bass you just feel like you've got no sound it's all trebles and um so finding a good headphone that you like is super helpful and i'd, I'd say take your own headphones to the recording studio as much as possible and then recording yourself at home is is such a great thing to do because you become more conversant with firstly how easy it is to manipulate um stuff in the recording studio you can edit and cut and paste and all that stuff it's super handy and just comping up stuff that you've made listening to your own playing i'm really interested in the fact that that um you can sort of idealize your playing when you record and that can actually start affecting how you think about you sort of create a perfect version of yourself and then you start sort of somehow playing like that because you've created it it's a very odd modern yeah. thing it's a bit it's a bit weird but that's what recording can be great for that no it's like it's kind of a different form of practicing or it's a new tool in practice i remember the I've, i haven't done a lot of recording but i've done some and i remember Recording this line, I thought I was right in the pocket, and I'm sure lots of people have had this experience. Go into the sound booth, the guy's got his Pro Tools set up, and you could just see I'm like, not quite with the drums on this mm. one, or not quite. And he's like, oh, no problem. Boop. And he just moved my note over. I thought, whoa. You know, it's like, it was like magic. When well, I, it is magic, but it, it's interesting how um, the state of mind, when you're worried, you often play early. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you like say not too sure of that chord change or you weren't sure if that was the right there's just little little creeping little concerns you might have while you're playing and the thing i've noticed is most of that stuff is early which is bizarre neurologically because you think if you didn't know what was going on you'd be a bit late and you'd sort of you know oh whoops you know but it's funny how the concern about anything musically makes you play well makes me play early and then when you're really confident and well prepared you often sit it's like there's more space in your mind free to actually concentrate on the music around you because i think it, it it i know from teaching you know some fantastic young students who often are concerned with all that stuff we discussed here like making the changes and that often they desert the feeling of the time altogether and it's such a mistake because you know sometimes what you'd want is is the opposite you want really lovely feeling time because it's interesting you mentioned time mm -hmm. in your own in and i i it's the same thing it's the most common critique i think all being you know bass is is hard to play in tune all the time but often you know the thing you notice when you listen to the recording is where things are landing it's like wow i just got so early onto that that passage i'm struggling with i'm playing that so early and it takes you three shots at it and then you realize 
oh, that's where it should sit. <laughs> and that's a really, I find that, I find that fascinating. And so I think the recording process for that is really insightful, you know, into developing your playing, listening to what you play like when things sit really nicely and going, oh, I can, I can use that to develop myself as a like mental image of that feeling of um, whatever. And to me, it sort of feels, it feels uh, a little bit emptier of, of, of some quality that's there when you're worried about the music. There's a, there's a plainness to it that's sort of simple and pure. And that's, that's something that recording, you can hear it, especially if you idealise. I'm not saying you idealise everything, but you can hear it in your, you can hear how your playing could sound when that stuff's not present. And then start thinking, well, like I will commonly, I'm sort of segueing into another topic here, but I will commonly practice and, and say, I've just lately, um, started uh, on the advice of another bass player practicing in front of a mirror and mm -hmm. watching myself play and i it's really i found it incredibly instructive to to do something that i'm doing and then think how can i do that with more relaxation mm. just keep going deeper into the relaxation even if, it, if it's things that are challenging like playing with the bow and trying to keep the bow say really square to the string you know and just and watching the tip of the bow and thinking when I'm playing say a fast detache stroke what's the tip of the bow and, and if I start seeing it sort of rock and rolling a lot I'm thinking well what's going on there and you know I, I've you know I realized I've been lifting my little pinky off sometimes which in my technique is just causing it to rock and all I had to do was put the pinky on, relax my hand, and the bow started straightening up and behaving itself within what I'm trying to cope with. But I find that process, like the recording process you mentioned earlier, is really useful. Just observing yourself and going, ooh, how can I drop the shoulders a bit more? And I, you know, the incredible players that I've seen who are really quite incredible players, that they all look pretty relaxed to me. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. I both recording, you know, I am continually amazed at. You're, it's like you're describing my life with the rushing, you know, or like being early. Like I, I so often I record myself, and I, I'm so concerned about this passage or the intonation on this thing, and it's like, well, but it's rushing like crazy, you know, and then and or it sounds this or that, and I found that so helpful. And moving to San Francisco, we have this place, and of course, in San Francisco, they put mirrors up everywhere because everything's so small, they want to make it look bigger. <laughs> but but the, the, the plus side for a bass player is I have full-length mirrors all around where I practice, so mm -hmm. I've been spending so much more time uh, looking in the mirror, and also with my students, looking in the mirror and the thing that I've, I do with myself and with the students is I like scale one to ten how do you think you know tension wise here eight could you bring it to a seven could you yeah. bring it to, you know we if we're if we're completely relaxed we're lying on the floor not playing bass but you know how can we be as easy as possible and yeah you know well, well, like it's really just your, your finger on the string in the end isn't it yeah. the, the rest can kind of let go a lot of the time yeah it's really just your relationship of each of your hand your hand on the pits or the bow and then your left hand on the string, and after that, a lot of stuff can be let go. Um, it, you know, it's another reason why I, I try and vary, in my own playing, I try and stand a bit and I sit. I use I use the up-down bow, we were discussing this earlier, but I use mm. the, I play sometimes German bow, sometimes French. I'm a better French player than I am a German player. Um, but I do love um, not getting too fixed on things and trying to, to find different ways to, to, to play and it's, it's the same sort of thing as when you, if it gives you the chance to observe yourself and not get too comfortable and you know how are my shoulders sitting and, and can I can I do this more relaxed you, you can always do everything more relaxed yeah. but I do th I do think a lot about you know just changing positions you know it's a big thing on the bass moving notes is a is a common cause of I guess worry it's like how do I get up a fourth from an E flat to a high A flat? You know, that, that's kind of like right through the transition on the neck. If you're standing, you've got a the base is going to um, move. It might you might get the neck onto your shoulder. All that area. That's a difficult area of the base to play, I think. Um, but it it sort of tends to ingrain this set of uh, nervous ticks about the worry about that particular shift. But the, the practice room is just that chance to, to, to slow it all down. Maybe you sit down, do it sitting, and think, well, it feels great when I sit. What's going on with my standing stance that doesn't let that happen? 
and then perhaps taking some of those things you've learnt out of your sitting and and you know there are some other things going on there like when you're playing pits you you usually pinning the back of the fingerboard with your thumb so you can stop the base spinning around when you're standing um, it's not so much a problem when you sit um, when you're playing with the bow you don't have that security you've got the bow sticking out to the side there so you're not pinning the base with your right hand all you've got is your left hand your posture and your setup and I think that's a really interesting thing about how you st- how well your stance works when you play and it's just so important not like I think you've got to love shifting I really do I think you've got to think this is great this is my chance to develop um, and I guess in regards to that the thing I've done a lot of is slow the shifting right down try and do the slowest shift I can for a while just to observe the mechanics of moving and I found that really helpful it mightn't be everyone's cup of tea but that's really helped me as a player because I I came to it late and I'm still still working on all that stuff there are a lot of career options out there for musicians and Barry Colstein of Colstein Music has some great advice about keeping your options open I, I generally will tell anybody that goes off to you know going as performance go after your dreams but also prepare yourself you know because it's not always the easiest profession to to pursue and i'm a firm believer that in life you you, you pick up as much knowledge as you can those are your armament in life and you put them in your back pocket you may never have to draw upon it but it's a nice thing to have Colson and Sons for 70 years now has been working to connect bass players with the finest instruments and help them achieve their goals and find those opportunities in their lives. Thank you so much to Barry and everybody at Colstein Music for sponsoring the podcast. Hey, this is Danny Zeman. I'm a jazz bass player currently living in Basel, Switzerland, uh, originally from the Western New York region, Buffalo, and then Rochester. Um, I tour throughout the States, throughout Europe, and Asia, playing various uh, styles of jazz, windy hops, uh, early swing, more modern jazz. Um, I'm currently, again, living in Switzerland for the next next year or so. Um, right now, I'm playing the D'Addario Helicor Pizzicatos, and I've been using them for about seven years now, and I have to say they are my favorite, favorite thing for jazz. Um, the clarity in sound and tone, intonation, everything is just exactly exactly what I'm looking for. They're not too bright. There's a really wonderful musical sustain that you can manipulate, uh, you know, for when you're playing ballads or more up-tempo uh, tunes. I mean, just the range of color and control that you get out of them is just exactly what I need. It suits my needs uh, perfectly. And I definitely encourage anyone who's looking for a, a new string to check out or, or wants something that uh, you know, is is great for jazz and gives you more of that sustained sound, definitely consider the Helicor Pizzicatos. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. Did you know that they regularly ship bases nationally from coast to coast? Contact their team to find out more information about the shipping process and how you can get your dream base delivered to your doorstep. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BassViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Buying an instrument or bow is a major decision, especially the first time a student's looking for an instrument. Here's A440 Violin Shop's Michael Spadaro on what he advises. We usually start with a, an approximate price range and we'll show them anything within that price range and then to give them a little bit of context, I'll often show them instruments that are more or less expensive than that. But I, I say to play as many instruments or bows as possible before you buy. Whether you're looking for a new instrument or a new bow or that next step in your journey, A440 Violin Shop has got you covered. Look for them online at a440violinshop.com and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Well, it's, it's interesting how, because I, I was somebody, I think a lot of bass players have gone through this. I started standing, then I sat down on a stool, and I quickly lost the ability to play standing. 
I think a lot of, especially Arco players, orchestrally oriented players do that. And then I was just so sick of playing like a fourth grader anytime there wasn't a stool and I'd find myself doing a master class but like I can't demonstrate I thought this is just like shameful okay so so and also I'm left-handed and I had this theory that um which I don't know is true but I, my theory at the time was that uh sitting is a little easier for your left hand standing is a little easier for your right hand because of the leverage I think now they just are different I and and when I sit, I do what you're describing I, I I'm practicing for a while standing and then I sit down and it feels amazing and it all feels amazing and then I'm sitting for a while as playing orchestra you know recently and then I finally I stood up and that feels amazing for both the hands but I do think starting to practice standing and shifting pra- pra- standing, I think it may be a better shifter overall because I think I was maybe a bit lazy when I was sitting because yeah. you don't have that balance. I agree. I, I, my experience is, is the same as that. And I think that, I think you do, I, I think most players who, who do both would say that their their sitting intonation is probably better when they sit if they mm-hmm. they do both. Unless there's specifically players who, like there are players who just can't get comfy sitting. But, um, uh, uh, like there are some areas of the bass, like shifting up on the A string, say from from your mid E up to a B. That's ha- standing. There's a whole lot of problems there because the the fingerboard's curving away from you. You're pulling the ba- bass away from yourself. So that that's a tricky one. We're sitting that that shifts a piece of cake. So you can you can be you know going up that area of the bass really easily while you sit. But um, there are ways around that too, to do with straightening the bass and 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 taking the bass with other parts of you. And I, and there's also the, the issue of how pin height and getting it up higher sometimes can be useful for that stuff. There's the whole offset pin thing as well. Have you played around with that or experimented with the offset? Pin? I I haven't. Um, I, and um, it's probably because the bass I have now is quite small and the bass I had before this one was really big and that's the thing I was going to say to you earlier about really big basses are pretty hard to stand with little basses to me feel they get in closer to your body they're a bit bit closer and I had a big wide shouldered in the upper bout space and it just seemed to be a long way from you when you stood up um, maybe that was just some deficiency in my stance but I don't think so um, but that that generated. It was just so easy to stand with a smaller bass. It's it's still quite deep, but it's small in in front profile, if you know what I mean. Um, and so yeah, I, I, I've and it's got a very long end pin on it, so I'm not sure it would be pretty strange to put a bent end pin. But I've I've yeah I've I've tried um, basses who have those bent end pins, and they they they're really radically different the way they throw the bass forward it sounds like a, a really good thing to do i'm just would be a bit terrified to do it to an old <laughs> antique bass myself yeah and, it, and it, like you're saying so basses are so radically different and there's nothing like the experience of playing like a a big shouldered violin corner italian bass with like a stenholm extension on it all this weight coming back at you yeah. is so different from something you know slope shoulders and yeah uh, but yeah the 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 angle end pin thing i always think is interesting i've always been a little nervous about doing anything that's non standard because I go and play on other instruments all the time. Maybe it's an irrational fear, but I always I always worry about getting uh, accustomed to something and then I go somewhere. It's like w- that thing with I always had to have a stool. I, I just want to keep, since probably only 5% or less of basses have those angle end pens. That's sort of my concern. Yeah, and, and it's it. I understand. Yeah, I, I felt a bit the same with, once I started you know, traveling more at a period of life to play it was just great to travel without a seat and not having to worry about a seat and sometimes you know if there's a there's seat somewhere you can or you're playing in the pit or doing that sort of a gig it's great to sit down like everyone else but um yeah it's it's an interesting i think they're both i think they're both super instructive and i think um it, it benefits it's benefited me enormously to, to do both sit down sometimes and and observe that beautiful free-flowing movement you get on the neck and then then think about what you what i'm doing in my standing stance that i can um to, to help me to to have that same sense of fluidity and like you said the ability to move physically while you're playing is lovely when you stand and i do i, I feel that um the difference that feeling of standing for a while sitting for a while they're both a little freedom from each other yeah like switching from german to french they both feel amazing for a while um but you know 
it, you, 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 you can't hide from your own limitations. <laughs> you know, there's always things that you can do better in, a, in any of those situations. Well, and, it's, and I haven't played around. I, I teach sometimes on German bow just to make myself play. And I always find I, I'm my I, I would some one of these days I'll start developing my skills a little bit more. But how do you think what feels easier on German? What feels easier on French? How do the two influence each other for you? Okay, well, well I'm using one of those Chappelle frogs, which is called an up down frog, mm-hmm. which I um, adapted to my nice French stick. So I, I probably play a, a French bow that's got a slightly changed frog and slightly deeper deeper sort of depth to the frog than a normal French bow so it's not a proper German bow and I started using that a couple of years ago with the specific aim of wanting to play sometimes with a German because I often used to pick up my French bow and hold it in German just to tune up or you know play the end of a ballad in a tune when I wasn't playing much but I also because I'm not a full-time orchestral bow player I was also or I'm not always on the bow and I just so when I have to do a I do a lot of practice with the bow just to keep my arco playing in shape. Um, And I noticed, you know, when I've had a run where I've done a lot of, so I've just come off a run of doing a a big long run of West Side Story and and that's got got quite a chunky amount of bow playing. So of course that's, you know, your bow starts to really fall into shape just from doing so much playing. Um, So I bought, so I just noticed um, I, I will get back to your question. No, <laughs> I just noticed that when I was, I just developed some funny habits in my French bow playing, just from mainly practicing and not playing on the gig. Like, for instance, I didn't have good dynamic control. I couldn't do great swelled notes. I couldn't really control the bow if it started to bounce. And so I guess switching to a different way of gripping there was like doing a cold restart of my arco technique. And just my experience of my right arm was that I. I just had a more hanging, straighter arm, and I thought, gee, that feels good, even though I couldn't, say, control the bounce as well, and a few things, but I noticed that I, I had a very relaxed stroke, and so I tried to then observe that and bring that back that back to my French playing, and, um, you know, if, when I listened in recordings to both, I noticed I had much more control of anything off the string with the French bow, and, you know, I'm, I'm still, that would be my default, but... Um, Th- that was the main reason I did it was in order to I just love the way that natural stroke comes out so beautifully with the German grip you just can use the weight of your arm and out comes the note mm-hmm. it's a really big lovely full sound and there's a you have just have to um, be more careful with the way you you, you, you want to keep your wrist smooth and you want to have don't have that hard gear change when you change directions with the French bow the, the grip has to function so well and so in in my time of teaching at universities with other students, for instance, I've often encouraged, say, jazz players who aren't, who have got a very rigid French bow grip with rigid fingers and the thumb is straight and there's no wrist. I've often just got them to start again on German and go and see a classical teacher who I would refer them to and just get them to start from scratch. And they end up sounding great because they'd often just use the bow at home and never actually had formal tuition at all. Like a lot of jazz players would just use the bow without any instruction and it just was so hard to remedy for me when I was teaching that I just thought oh, let, let's just start again and um, that was a good solution and that sort of led me to, to, to being able to play both both so I could demonstrate it to someone so it sort of came a little bit out of my teaching and just out of my own interest to sort of continually keep developing technically because I'm um, starting playing in my 20s I guess I'm still trying to catch up well, I, that's one of the beauties of bass, though, is that we do have that hot, cold reset bow, right? I mean, you're kind of out of luck if you play violin. They're not going to, you know, it's, uh, you know, pick up cello or something, but even that, or bass. But uh, that is that is such a nice thing. It's, it's easier sometimes to just start from scratch with something, you know, yeah. on, the other, on the other side of things. On, absolutely. Um, the other thing I've done, which might be of interest, is <clears throat> it's not to do with playing with the bow, but it's just to do with thinking about, the fingerboard because mm. because something I do a lot of now is I do a lot of ear training regularly in my practice I do ear training and a lot of that is intervals and a lot of that is singing intervals and sounding them and also at the same time visualizing where they are on the fingerboard all the time 
So I'll, you know, do like sheets of intervals, just random intervals thrown together. And while I'm singing them, I'm actually trying to sing the pitch that it is on the bass. I'm just like, I'm trying to sort of map out the bass all the time in my head. And, you know, it seems it's incredibly useful for improvising. It's just like knowing where stuff is. It's that. It's like like um, knowing where things are on the bass, having options for... Well, there's an E there, but there's also an E there, and there's an E there. Um, it's a whole bunch of things that's incredibly useful, especially as an improviser, because there's that whole sense of um, knowing where stuff is. It's just so important to be able to orient yourself with sound that's around what you're playing when you're... Imp- I, f- I feel like when I'm improvising, I, I want to know not just what I'm playing, but what's that other sound? Mm. How does that relate to my sound? How can I interact with that sound? How can I... Am I am I on the root or am I on the the fifth and and you know it's pretty common to get a whole bunch of complicated changes thrown at you on a chart like I'm preparing for a recording at the moment with some diabolical harmony. Um, it's super useful to to like build a lattice work between all these notes and intervals. So you've got this way of negotiating harmony that's not just about I have to go through this set of arpeggios to get through the harmony. It's like you know I can invert the chord or Hang on, if I'm that's that third becomes the root of the next. It's all that sort of stuff, but it's not even just that. It's just that when I hear things melodically, I want to know all the time what they are on the fingerboard. I want to be able to negotiate them on the board. I want to be able to find my way from this note to that note, and that's a really important part. It, it, it's slightly different to because because you, you can't work it out in that way that I might say when preparing, playing through some repertoire on the bass. For practice, like playing Bach or something, there's stuff I can work out. I can say, oh, well, I've jumped to the harmonic D. I can get to that high G, uh, high B. That's great, but but um, I've got to be able to do that on the fly as yeah. well. It's yeah. not it's not the same, you know. It's like where is that stuff? And so there's a really big. If, if you were to ask me, which you haven't asked me, but I'm going to ask myself the question <laughs> anyway. I'll be rhetorical. If you were to ask me, that's one of the big differences between the way technique develops for a, say, contemporary style improvising player as against a classical player is that, and those players that play a lot of both would probably agree, is that there's that, that way you're, you're building language all the time, not just building repertoire. But they're, they're, in the end, they're similar. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction, though. You know, there, there's a there's a bassist named Paul Cannon who plays in the, the is it Ensemble Modern, I think, is the group, but this contemporary music group, and he is faced with the most hilariously insane technical challenges on the instrument and wow. he for a while I think he's still doing this occasionally but for a while he was really into posting on Facebook like the the ins- like like you know all of a sudden they all break out to, to kazoos and then like go into this like polyrhythms and 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 just showing I mean like the the difficulty of some of the stuff he's had to do in this group I mean it's like a puzzle that you don't know the rules to for some of these yeah. pieces and there's no recording and and so I just find that whole like skill set fascinating that's that sounds like he, he, that musician would be working from notation yes wow. yeah for yeah he in his case not always not always because there's there's some non notated things too but but more on the notated side yeah that that's a pretty amazing skill set and um of course you know there's music that gets beyond your ability to orally sort of carry it at all. It's it, there's so much going on. It's so confusing, um, and I guess when I'm talking about that a way of hearing intervallically, it's it, it was. A, I just know it's a really important um, tool for me because it's like it's a thing that that can accompany you at all moments to give you harmonic security when you're playing. It's that. I, I'm here, but I know I can go there to find even just what's available to you within a position, you know, uh, any position on the bass, what are the notes that surround that note, what position you're what's available to you, um, how can you get from there to there using bridging positions and all, all that stuff's super useful, especially if you can hear it at the same time because it's 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 tricky if, if you're technical command of, of the instrument is only based in physical movements right yeah as against it's a house of cards <laughs> yeah it's a then, house of cards then, then you pick up a bass you don't know and you can't play well yeah, yeah and, and yeah. you and it's sort of like it gets you it, it's super useful at, at times but you, it's really helpful to have as an adjunct to that to also have that you know what that sounds like because it's so so 
you know, pre-hearing at times is it just gives you the earliest response to your own plane that you can get. If you, if you know what something sounds like just before you land it, you've got this fantastic reference for minute adjustment, like mm-hmm. being in tune or... Because uh, the worst thing that's ever happened to me musically is o- oral disorientation. That's very distressing because you just don't know... One, you don't know where you are, you're really sunk. Because even when you play a, a, a bad clam but you know what it should be you're halfway there straight away because you've got the reference it's when you you don't know what anything is that's a very hard very difficult thing and luckily that doesn't happen to me too often I don't think (laughs) well you know it's it's like working with students who haven't done any singing before or singing against one of the exercises I do is you know just start on the G string we're going to play an A major one octave scale play A okay now sing B before we go to B but or we could do a more uh, an easier interval in a second. We could sing D. Okay, now go to D. Now sing A. Go back to A. Um, I'm assuming you've like like with the the students that maybe are new to well any sort of or, or like what do you, what I do don't you... know. I've I've tried to encourage students to do that. I mean, often yeah, it it's an interesting combination of two things uh, becoming a good player because there's there is a physical element like there's the shape of your hand as we know when we start playing the bass is just getting your hand shaped together so the spacing is even mm-hmm. and you can but there's also a mental element there because you need to have as as you move up the neck the intervals narrow and so you sort of need to have that proprioception thing going on to when you're here the hand spacing's this there's a lot of stuff to that and and so Sometimes it, it's I've I've spoken to all string players. We all occasionally get freaked out by the fact that we somehow just know that that's that note, <laughs> and you know it's it's a I funny know. one. It's, it's a really really odd thing, and I think I actually think that's one of the beauties of the bass because it's a large physical instrument. The distances are wide. There's a definite difference between what it feels like to play the D on your G string. Um, compared to the G, like it, you, you're reaching around the shoulders. So those things are really helpful cues to playing the instrument, which I think is great. I think the expanse between the open G and the, the D is is one of the most, perhaps the the, the part that you've got to get, work out how to get around because it's it all feels a bit the same. Right, right. Whereas I feel like thumb position actually starts, every spot on the thumb position often feels like where you are. You get used to that. And so I play occasionally play electric bass as well and you know that's reasonably difficult to, to play without looking at because you've got none of those beautiful cues that the double bass has i think they're really quite useful and i think that's where the that's where the bass has an advantage over other string instruments perhaps with the exception of the cello which seems to be beautifully ergonomically designed in that way but um i think those things are quite useful so in terms of the intervals i suppose i, I would yeah, I would I would probably encourage someone to do that as as a player, but but it's more in my own playing. Getting back to that thing I mentioned earlier was there's was what do you have available to you when you're improvising in the now when you're playing? What what, what can you access? And it seems to me that that some of the best playing I've done and some of the great playing I've heard other musicians do is they seem to have options of what to play when they're improvising particularly it and it's often that wonderfully refreshing left turn in their playing that's really beautiful and I, I you know from from the study I've done and the, the my own investigation into it it's often their ability to think a little bit beyond that obvious step it's it's mm-hmm. there's a little extra thing now I've in I've discovered that that can come from oral conceptions that you can develop independently of playing it's just like okay what if i hear that a is the third of the chord rather than the tonic and it gets you out of those loops i think that's where the ears are particularly useful it's like and i hear that in in uh, um, other great improvisers is that oh you know we're going to take another turn here and that note gets recast and that's such a that's to me one of the most beautiful things about say say tonal jazz improvising is that ability to reset stuff yeah. and it's a big part of all beautiful you know harmonic writing in in all fields of music in classical music it's that you know a note gets played but suddenly it's 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 a new subject and it's such a it's it, i think it'll it'll 
probably fascinate me till the day I die, <laughs> that particular aspect of music. I, I think I just love it so much. And, but, I, but I think you can, I think just as a bass player, you're not a keyboard player or a guitar player, so you haven't got those cues. So the structuring of how you hear, you, have, you can build that and layer it up so that you've got things to rely on that, that sort of, um, they're like extra tools that you can mm. use to play in the moment so that that one note is just not meaning one thing. It can mean a number of things. And that's sort of what I was getting at with the conceiving of the... the thinking of the fingerboard and, and and singing intervals that you're actually seeing on the fingerboard and maybe checking them out checking if you're in tune because you know we all we all have little things that trip us up and we we think they're one thing and they're another and so that's sort of what I meant rather than um, something I would give a student because I think it's 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 for for a beginner I think it's a bit there's just a struggle just to get anything out sometimes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so right. it'd be almost like better to just say, well, this is where the note B is, and let's bung our finger down, the fourth finger down, and let's play that B. Um, yeah, um, and I think it also, it, it loops back upon that earlier question we had is about, it's a, it's a great, often mature learners come to the bass and the music's already formed in them mm-hmm. and so they're learning to play the music they already know on the bass it's interesting I, I think it will be another fascinating study to look at players who've actually played learnt all of music from the bass that's a little bit different to what I, I oh, am yeah. as a player I've sort of learnt music and then came to the bass mm-hmm. and a, a lot of musicians I know are like that but not all of them yeah, it's 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 always interesting to me, the, and you're seeing more and more of them. But people who like, because I think at, at a certain time, everybody everybody started on something else and came to the base. But but I, I've I've encountered more and more young people that that was that's it. That's where it originated. And there's definitely yeah. there's a there's a bass player, former student of mine, working in New York City now. He's he's been. Uh, quite successful and bass he started when he was two years old no joke wow he was in diapers and playing bass oh and my so God. and there's just a there's a facility to i mean it, he also can you know get away, get around the piano and other things but that was all after bass and there's wow. a there's a there's a familiarity with the language there's a, a, a just an ease to his playing that i think i, I think agree. you see that when you see like someone starting violin at four or five i agree yeah wow. i think i think i've noticed the same thing too and and that's why i'll i'll never i don't think myself as a player i've i've got no laurels to rest on in that way <laughs> i'm gonna always i'm gonna slog away and and I, I don't even mind you know um i also think it's so important like that as you as you mature as a player, that things change in your playing. I think that's fine. I think, you know, maybe, you know, if, if, it's not the end of the world. If I'm still playing and I'm 80 and I haven't got mega chops, but I've got a lot to say, in, you know, it, it's sort of like that, that idea of um, responding to, to what you have and what mm-hmm. you're around because it's that ability to be musical yeah. in, in however you, fi- you find yourself. And that's one of the beautiful things about uh, about about music, right? And like like just seeing people, you can be in your seventies, you can be in your eighties, you can be, uh, you know, even I've I've heard from bassists, you know, even old, I mean, Milt Hinton was still playing, you know, pushing ninety. I, I think. like that. Yeah, yeah. I, li- I like yeah. I like. Well, I've if you I've noticed that some of the like a lot of. A lot of great, great jazz players and improvisers died tragically young. We never got yeah. to see, to plot that evolution. But some of the really magnificent players that have had a long career, it's very interesting to see their playing change and realise that there's no way they'll stay exactly the same player. Yeah. across, the, Especially the ones who, say, that era from the 50s through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it, it, there's so much happened in music. It's it's nice to see that. It's a, it's, it's a nice thing to realise you don't have to sort of stay in one place. And, because so much happens happened to the bass since 19... Well, in, in, in jazz bass playing, there's so much... There's so many ways to play the bass. Mm-hmm. Well... I know if you had a long day, I want to be respectful of your time, but this is, Ben, this is like probably the most idyllic setting 
I've had for an interview. Uh, certainly better than sitting in my office over Skype. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I hope that we, we did <laughs> encounter a little bit of background music, but it's uh, the beautiful Botanic Gardens. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you have a great trip in sunny Melbourne. It's been a pleasure to be on part of this uh, wonderful series you've created. Thanks for having me along. Ben, thank you so much. What a fun conversation. Folks, check him out at his website, benrobertson.com.au. Uh, lots of AU links coming soon for all these wonderful folks that I chatted with in Australia. I just had such a great time on this trip, if you couldn't tell. And I, it, this is something I want to try to do once a year. Last year, 2018, well, I guess two years ago at this point, 2018, I went to New York City for a week. 2019, I went to Australia for two weeks. So I guess my question to you is, where should I go next? And who should I chat with? Let me know. Feedback at ContrabasedConversations.com. But like I said at the outset, many more conversations coming soon from Australia. Thank you to Rob Nairn for organizing the Melbourne Base Day. And thank you to everybody who was so hospitable and made me feel so welcome in Australia. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to everybody. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making beautiful bases and just finished another one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. And thank you to Krista Copper for cataloging and archiving everything we talk about here on the podcast. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 